Okay, so um, we're moving into um, the deep past now. Um, and we're starting with um, Stephanie Mawson from Cambridge, who has um, recently completed a PhD on the early Philippines and who is now a postdoctoral researcher at St. John's uh, College in Cambridge, uh, and who is developing uh, from her original PhD uh, into a new project. Um, right, how are we doing? I tried to get them all to come in, but there's a, a slight... Uh, yes, I think Christine has gone to shepherd all the remainders, remaining people in, but uh, let's make a start then, if you'd like to go. 20 minutes. So thanks everyone for being here so bright and early and it's a real honour to be here and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, so I guess we probably all know that the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines is marked by conflict between the Spanish and the polities in the south part of the archipelago. Um, and this was famously dubbed the Moro Wars. Um, and this paper revisits this conflict to look at the alliances that were built between different Southeast Asian groups um, at the end of the 16th century. So I wanted to first just begin with a brief overview of the conflict between Spain and the Moro communities of Mindanao and Holo uh, during the 17th century, uh, before moving on to look in detail at the alliance that was built between the Miguindanaos and Ternate. So, and one really important um, aspect of this story is that the Moros were not one polity. Uh, Mindanao itself hosted many different communities, but alliances offered um, these groups the opportunity to build on each other's strengths, including gathering intelligence that they had on their opponents, um, as well as combining their military capabilities. And in the late 16th century, Tanate was actually the, both the most militarily powerful um, and uh, the best at forging alliances with surrounding populations in this region. Um, and their alliance with the Maguindanaos um, posed a sincere threat to European co colonial ambitions in the region. So the first conflicts between um, the Spanish colonizers and the Moro communities in Mindanao and Holo began only a few years after the Spanish founded the city of Manila in 1570 and established a galleon trade with Mexico. The origins of these conflicts can be traced back to the Spanish ambitions to expand their control and influence over a large part of Southeast Asia. At least in the early days, the Philippines was seen as a stepping stone to a much greater prize, which was um, the Moluccas, uh, where the lucrative trade in spices um, such as cloves, nutmeg and mace was centred. Um, the Portuguese had maintained an outpost in the Moluccas since the 1520s and dominated this trade, but the Spanish had ambitions for wresting control over this trade away from the Portuguese. Um, and so consequently, Spanish ambitions, um, uh, they had ambitions to expand southwards from the Philippines, um, and they proposed to do this very early on after the founding of Manila. And these were, ambitions were most clearly articulated by um, Governor Francisco de Sande, who was the third governor of the Philippines. Sande argued that if reinforcements were sent from Spain, um, they would uh, not only very quickly conquer Borneo, Mindanao and Holo, but also extend Spanish domination over um, the Spice Islands and Java. And he also believed that um, China itself could be conquered just much in the same way that the Spanish conquered Mexico, um, as, sorry, the Aztecs in Mexico, with just a, a handful of valiant conquistadors. So a uh, few other royal officials really shared this optimism, but they did agree that it was a good idea to conquer the neighboring Muslim polities on the islands of Mindanao and Holo, um, where they believed that they would find gold, cinnamon, and other riches. And so at the end of the 16th century, the conquest of Mindanao and Holo was seen as essential to expanding Spanish power across maritime Southeast Asia. Beginning in 1578, the Spanish began a wave of aggressive military in incursions into the territories of Borneo, um, Mindanao, and Holo. 
And although they expected these um, conquests to be easy, they in fact initiated a pattern of conflict that would continue for most of the 17th century. The polities in the southern um, archipelago responded with force to the aggressive territorial ambitions of Spain, and slave raiding was the cornerstone of their military response. Um, raiding parties from Mindanao, Holo, Caraga, Borneo, and the Camocones attacked coastal villages in the Spanish-controlled part of the Philippines, seizing thousands as captives, um, as, as slaves, basically. And these raids not only thwarted Spanish expansionary ambitions, but actively destabilized new Spanish settlements in the Visayas and the Camarines. Virtually no community south of Manila was exempt from the yearly assault, but the Visayan territories were the most frequently impacted. Um, for example, over just three years between 1599 and 1602, um, Maguindanao raiders seized 2,300 slaves from Visayan territories, while in 1635, Governor Hurtado de Coquera um, estimated that raiders from Borneo and the Camacones had collectively captured around 25 to 30,000 vassals of the King of Spain. On occasion, raiders would venture very close to Manila as a way of demonstrating the weaknesses of Spanish defences. And raiders also used um, other tactics to disrupt the Spanish occupation in, of the Philippines. The Miguindanaos in particular tried to convince certain communities in the Visayas to break their connections with Spain and to become tributaries of the Miguindanaos instead. Um, and the Sulus of Holo attacked infrastructure such as shipyards as a way of damaging Spanish economic power in the region. On the whole, the Spanish struggled to respond to all of these raiding activities. Initially, they tried uh, um, raising defensive armadas to protect the Scion communities before shifting to diplomacy and then finally to aggressive military incursions. But most of this is actually quite ineffective um, and the pattern of raiding continued throughout the century up until 1663 when the Spanish were forced to withdraw all of their military personnel from Mindanao, um, Tanate and the Calamianas. Alliances between different polities in the Southern Archipelago were a really important part of this conflict. And I'm, just, I'm going to focus here on one particular alliance that emerged between the Maguindanaos and Tanate. So who were the Tanatans? Tanate and Brunei were two major poles of commercial and political influence in this region at the end of the 16th century. Uh, both were trading hubs with extensive connections um, throughout the Malay world, as well as established trading relationships with China, Siam, the Arabian Peninsula, and more recently with the Portuguese. As the only clove-producing islands in the world, the Moluccas had attracted traders to their ports for centuries. Um, but Ternate's rise to prominence as a regional power in the late 16th century was in fact linked to, the, to this relationship with the Portuguese. Since 1522, the Portuguese had occupied fortified positions in Ternate and Tidore and had established a unique trading partnership with these islands. Um, and this relationship was never particularly peaceful. Um, but a series of events in the 1570s led the Tanatans to break their alliance with the Portuguese, allowing them to rapidly expand their regional influence. In 1570, the Sultan of Tanate, Hairun, was assassinated by the Portuguese, initiating a period of anti-colonial rebellion, leading to the eventual expulsion of the Portuguese from the island in 1575. And over the course of the next several decades, the Tanatans set about establishing an extensive tributary network which extended across uh, the majority of island polities throughout the Banda Celebes and Malucca seas. By these means, Tanate consolidated their power in the region, seized greater control over the spice trade from neighbouring rivals in Tidore, um, and ensured that any uninvited uh, future European um, interventions would be met with considerable resistance. And the spice trade um, continued to thrive without a European monopoly. 
By these means, Sanate was able to strengthen not only, um, sorry, skipped ahead. Um, a 1603 description of Tanate noted the island regularly received traders from Java and elsewhere in the Malay archipelago, as well as Turks who travelled via Java and Aceh. Now, this interaction with lucrative global trading markets meant that Tanate had access to sophisticated weaponry, including artillery. Um, the king of Tanate ordered that no merchant would be allowed to trade with his vassal states unless they brought artillery with them. And by these means, Tanate was able to strengthen not only the forts on their own islands, but also to fortify a large part of the Moluccan archipelago. It was said that the main fort in Tanate alone was defended by 300 cannons and other types of artillery, as well as a thousand Moluccan soldiers who were equipped with coats of mail, doublets, and helmets that they had taken from the Portuguese. Additionally, they were backed by a, th a thousand Javans, Chinese, Archinese, and Turks, the latter of whom um, were experts in fire bombs and other explosive weapons. And so very quickly, Tanate became an extremely powerful and heavily militarized center at the heart of an expanding tribute network that encompassed a large part of Eastern Indonesia. In 1580, the Portuguese and Spanish crowns unified, ending their long-standing rivalry, rivalry in the region, and finally opening the Moluccas up to Spanish ambitions. Beginning in the 1580s, the Spanish led several expeditions to try and reimpose European control over the Moluccas. However, they found that by this stage, the Tanatans had grown into formidable opponents, thanks to their increasing militarization and regional alliance building. So it was within this context that an alliance between Tanata and, and the Mikindanaos emerged. And we can easily understand that this alliance was mutually beneficial. While Tanata saw Mindanao as a convenient block to Spanish expansion in the region, the Maguindanaos benefited from the military strength of the Tanatans encountering Spanish territorial incursions. So how did this alliance work in practice? Towards the close of the 16th century, Tanate was reported to have sent considerable aid to Mindanao in the form of shipbuilders, armourers, gunpowder manufacturers, artillery and manpower to help the Maguindanaos resist Spanish invasion into their islands. Um, the Spanish blamed the support offered by the Tanatans for their military failures against the Maguindanaos in the 1590s. Realising the power of this alliance, the Spanish began to incorporate a clause into their peace agreements, um, which stipulated that the Maguindanaos had to end their alliance with the Tanatans if they ever wanted to achieve peace with Spain. And such a demand by the Spanish actually had the opposite effect on the Mikindanaos, who saw that their alliance with the Tanatans was their most powerful weapon against Spanish um, expansionary efforts. So all of this reached a climax in 1597 when the Spanish organized an invasion of Mikindanao territories led by Captain Juan Bronquillo. Bronquillo sailed an army of 230 Spanish and 1,500 indigenous soldiers up the Palangi River to wage an assault on the Maguindanao fort of Buayan. When they arrived, they found that the Maguindanaos occupied a well-defended fort garrisoned with many soldiers and artillery. And although Ronquillo set up a siege of this fort, he was aware that defeating um, the Maguindanaos presented a considerable challenge. Writing back to Manila, he reported that after several skirmishes with the Maguindanaos on his way back to the, the fort, he was actually running low on ammunition. Um, they'd run down to just 3,000 bullets, which is enough for about two hours of firepower. And the soldiers were tired and hungry, and many had fallen sick or were injured. Um, at the same time, he knew that the Maguindanaos were willing to fight to the death, but also that they could easily um, flee by ship without being pursued. So it was at this point that 800 Tanatans sailed up the Palangi River, coming in aid of the Maguindanaos, who hoped that this powerful force would crush Ronquillo's armada. The Spanish learned afterwards that just before their arrival, the Maguindanaos had sent one of their nobles called Buisan to Tanate 
to ask for their aid in fighting the war. Well, in Ternate, Buisen arranged the marriage of, of the daughter of the king of Ternate to another Mekindanao ruler, Raja Mura, thus solidifying the alliance between the two polities. The king of Ternate then sent these 800 soldiers to intercept the Spanish on the Palangi River. So Ronquillo met the Ternatans by land and by water, and a major battle ensued in which the Ternatans were soundly defeated and their general, Kachul Babu, was killed. Um, this victory was significant. Up to that point, the Ternatans were widely believed to be undefeatable. Um, and in shock, the Mekindanaos agreed to sign Ronquillo's treaty, and he returned to Manila in triumph. But despite this, the Spanish never actually consolidated their victory. The following year, they withdrew all of their forces from Megindanao, ceding all of the gains that they had made against the Megindanaos and the Ternatans. And nominally, this was because of um, reports that English ships had entered Indonesian waters and they were worried that they might sail upon Manila. But the reality was that despite having won the battle, the Spanish lacked the capacity to genuinely occupy the territory of Maguindanao. Ronquillo's victorious expedition was in reality a costly reprisal mission that failed to achieve any conquest. The peace treaty with the Maguindanaos was dead almost as soon as it was signed, and Maguindanao raiding resumed and steadily increased in the years to come. So following these events in Mindanao, the Spanish began to focus their efforts on conquering the Malukas. Um, and this move was definitely uh, motivated by a desire to control the spice trade, but it was also clearly a response to the increasing influence of Ternate on Mindanao. An initial attempt in 1603 resulted in a humiliating defeat for the Spanish, with the Ternatans outsmarted, um, outsmarting them militarily. However, in 1606, bolstered by considerable reinforcements from Mexico and Spain, the Spanish finally succeeded in invading Ternate, seizing their fort and capturing their, their king. The king of Ternate captured Saide Bure, along with two dozen other Ternatan rulers, were captured and brought to Manila, where they were kept as hostages, for, by hostages of the Spanish crown for the next several decades. And in fact, Cachul Saide Bure never returned to his homeland. He, he died in Manila at the end of the 1620s. So the Spanish hoped that by conquering Ternate, they could cut off the supply of mil military aid to the Maguindanaos. The Maguindanaos in, re in turn responded to the Spanish invasion of Ternate through increased raiding. In 1608, the Audiencia reported that in April, the Maguindanaos had sailed with 77 Caracoas and attacked the islands of Leyte and Ibabel. They had robbed and burnt churches, taking many captives. The Spanish ambassador to Mindanao, Fray Malchor Otaro, laid the blame for this situation squarely on Spanish involvement in Ternate. He noted that the Maguindanaos were united with Ternate in religion, friendship, and trade, and recognized Ternate as superior. By that time, Ternate had also forged an alliance with the Dutch, who by then had established um, their own fortifications in that island, just a league away from the Spanish fort. Malcho Utado also reported that letters had been sent in secret from Mindanao to the imprisoned king of Ternate in Manila, and some Maguindanaos had traveled there with the aim of rescuing him and restoring him to his throne. Uh, Malcho Utado warned that it was possible that the Maguindanaos would ally themselves with the Dutch and gather together a great armada to sail on Manila to achieve their plan of liberating the Ternatan king and restoring him to his throne. Um, and he believed that this placed the Spanish in the greatest danger that they, they had ever been in since arriving in the Philippines. So while the 1606 conquest of Ternate was successful in that the Spanish succeeded in reclaiming possession of the Portuguese fort in, uh, in Ternate, the Spanish never overcame Ternate's power. The arrival of the Dutch in the Moluccas and their alliance with Ternate locked the Spanish into a costly war of attrition that lasted until their withdrawal from the Moluccas in 1663. 
at the same time, bereft of their long-standing ally, the Maguindanaos sought to uh, forge a new alliance through marriage with the Sulus of Hollow. This alliance was to prove as devastating as the last and raiding continued for the next half a century. During this period, raiding parties from Maguindanao, Holo, Caraga, the Camacones, and Borneo continued to threaten the Spanish presence in the region by attacking Spanish vessels, seizing indigenous Filipinos and Spanish missionaries as captives, eroding Spanish authority in the Visayas, and attacking key Spanish shipyards. Alliances between all of these oppositional polities were an integral part in ensuring that this resistance to Spanish domination was as effective as it was. So just to conclude, um, alliances were always an important part of intergroup warfare in the Philippine archipelago. During the colonial period, the alliances that we most often hear about are the ones forged between the Spanish and indigenous communities uh, which allowed the Spanish to gain a foothold in the archipelago and extend their authority. Yet we need to also consider that these alliances could become powerful tools used by communities against European ambitions in this region. Um, and this is certainly the case with the alliance built by the Maguindanaos and Tanatans at the end of the 16th century. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, and particularly for keeping to your time. We'll go straight on to uh, Miguel uh, Lorenzo um, with a very closely allied paper, shifting from the Spaniards uh, to the Portuguese. So um, whilst you're um, gathering up your... Um, Maybe one question for Stephanie. Quick question whilst we're changing speakers. No, right. Ah, yes, <laughs> Annabelle. definitely Tanate was the um, more superior power because they had, I mean, me, the Megidanaos also had access to artillery and they were like quite a heavily fortified and more like um, society, but the Tanatans just had much more of that and they had built this basically empire um, in maritime Southeast Asia um, at the end of the 16th century. And so I guess the alliance was kind of backing on to that. <laughs> 